How are we doing tonight? Great. Great. Good, good. Um, I'm just supposed to be a devotion. That means you don't have to put up with me for a super long time. But um, actually the message that I got tonight is going to be somewhat um, finishing up. About three weeks ago or so, I um, had the opportunity to, to share um, where we're at. And actually as Frankie had, had come to me, um, he got a hold of me on Sunday and asked me if I'd be willing to do a devotion. And I thought, yeah, man, let's, let's go ahead and move forward with this. And um, anyhow, I, I want to start this out, first of all, um, with prayer. Holy Father God, I ask that you would just take uh, this time, Lord Jesus. I, I pray that you would just open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us, so we would yield to you. Um, Lord God, as, as you would challenge us in directions, as you would um, take us in places that we've identified, as you would speak to our hearts on a personal level, I pray that we would just surrender and yield to you. And uh, Lord God, I pray that you would just fill me with your spirit. I have nothing to bring except for you, because you are the one that gives us the freedom, you're the one that gives us liberty, you're the one that gives us the vision. And I ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> um, I, just, just to encourage Frankie, on on Saturday we had a, a youth uh, or a children's ministry meeting, and as we were visiting, and and this, one of the things he shared is that people coming to salvation, um, basically, they come to salvation like 63 percent of them come to salvation from the ages of 4 to 14. And then from the ages of 14 on to 18, about 34%. Is that correct on that, Frankie, or am I pretty close? He can't hear me. 14 and 29 years old. 14 and 29 on the back end. Okay, okay. I, that was the one number I wasn't sure of. I got the, the percentages right. But 14 to 29... And then from 29 on to the grave, only about 3% of them come to a place of salvation. And, and as I was sitting there listening to, to Frankie share about this, all of a sudden it was like, oh dude, Lord, you got me fishing in an empty pond. There ain't much here. And, and, and anyhow, as, as that challenged my heart and, and, and my thought patterns, went to there, and this isn't, this isn't a hunting story, but I do want to share something that I learned years ago. I started archery hunting back in, in like, 89, 1989. And as I started archery hunting, what I ended up doing was, was I'd read every book that I could about archery hunting. And, and, and one of the specific books that I read was actually called Bugling for Elk. It was by... Uh, a man by the name of Dwight Shue. As a matter of fact, Dwight Shue was a, uh, a born-again believer. I, I went to a couple of the seminars, and usually he'd come to your seminar and everybody's waiting, or he'd come to do a seminar, and everybody was waiting for this, this great word, and he'd go, yeah, don't put hunting above your wives. <laughs> I was like, that, that ain't exactly what I wanted to hear today. But he was a man that loved God, and his... his, his Heart was in that. But I'll, I'll share what he said in that. I remember in this book, I was reading through there, and, and all of a sudden he said that the success rate for an archery hunter is somewhere between 8 and 12 percent. And so it doesn't take too much to figure that out. That means every one out of 12 years or one out of 8 years, you should be able to harvest an elk. In between that, guess what? You're going to get pretty hungry. Or, the other thing I identified was there was a whole bunch of people, and by the grace of God, I, I got to be one of them, that figured out this system to where they were successful in an elk hunt almost every year. But part of that was taking and taking the time to learn everything they could about the animal, learn everything they could about where they hang out, 
uh, just these things and, and, and then taking the time to practice so when they did with that one opportunity you might only get one or two shots in a whole season but guess what I would really practice well, I'd usually start practicing and shoot my bow in June, and then I'd go hunting in September for that one or two shots, the one or two possibilities of being able to take that shot. And what it dawned on me, the other side of that was, is back again, if that individual that was getting an elk almost every year, if you take a look at their statistics, they're way up high, but that means that 8 to 12% that it's talking about, that's really low because there's a whole bunch of guys that, that one day he he accidentally, I, I, don't know, I was cleaning my bow and an arrow went off and it killed that elk. It was weird, right? That accident. Got a question for you. Do statistics challenge you, or do they encourage you to be as successful as you can be? First verse I got is in actually Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. It says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he who keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, where I don't have a desire, where I don't have this drive in order to be successful, guess what? It ain't happening. Sorry. And as I was thinking about this, Frankie, Frankie asked me, and, and he even gave me a direction that he wanted me to go in, and I love that. I'm talking about the power of God. But it's taking the power of God and applying it in your life so that you can do the work that He has called to do because guess what? Without Him, we can't do it whatsoever. We're just, we're, we're, we're just out there wandering around the forest empty, blind, no idea. Actually, after that meeting, I, was, I met up with Pastor Mike and we were talking about just... I'm going to take a sideline because that's what I do. Hang on. This is a roller coaster. <clears throat> You want to know Pastor Mike's vision for this fellowship right here? It's to be a church to the unchurched. We're not interested. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I remember the first time I walked into this place, I was absolutely amazed at some of the structure that God had put in this fellowship as far as some of these old established saints. I'm talking about myself being old. But God had put this core group, but this core group that came, the vision was, hey, let's not just be the bless me club, let's go ahead and start reaching our community. Let's reach outside of our comfort zone, let's reach outside of what we know. So the statistics, as I'm sitting there, and, and Pastor Mike, I'm, I'm going back to Pastor Mike, the conversation, I, you guys ought to praise God because I used to chase squirrels and then I'd never get back to where I was at again. <laughs> By His grace, He brings me back to where I need to be. And, and so, hey, uh, Pastor Mike and I, we're, we're visiting and we're going, talking about stuff. And he goes, yeah, dude. He goes, why, why I was laid up, he goes, I was watching the deal and he was talking about these super successful guys that are taking these big rack bucks there year after year after year. And they were talking about their success rate, and, and, and a number of them, as they interviewed them, they were talking about these guys who watched these bucks all year round. They knew where those bucks were in June, July, August, September, October. And what they ended up doing is after they patterned these animals for years and years, what they found out is they came through these same exact areas year after year. And so that individual, that hunter, would set up in that spot, and when they came by, guess what? We were having meat for dinner, no more veggies. But in that, coming to this understanding, and, and, and I just sat here and, and, and I pondered this in our own ministry that God has called us to. How 
how do we take that 3% that Dallas and Miss Marcy are called to minister to and make that the most successful that the Lord would have? The Bible puts it this way in Psalms chapter 127.1, it says, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. And it says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Number one priority is we've got to have God in the middle of this. Number two, I need to have His vision. I need to have His... I, I'm, going, I'm going to read you guys just a portion of Scripture here. Um, I was going to read this the last time I shared, but then somebody got long-winded up here and was talking about other things and didn't get to read through the whole portion. Ephesians chapter 3. Just FYI, in the book, in the Bible, the word mystery is spoken of 22 times. 21 of the times is in the gospel, and every time it's spoken of in the gospel, or excuse me, once it's spoken of in the gospels, and the rest of the time is in the epistles. And every time Paul is speaking about this, he's standing there and he's watching what God's doing. And he's trying to wrap his mind around it. And even though he was right there in the middle of it, he's going, man, this is bigger than what I can even grasp. Is God too big for you to grasp? I hope so. Because if he's big enough to fix who I am, fix my problems, he's too big for me just to go ahead and understand and grasp. I have to understand him by faith. I have to reach out in that thing by faith. Let me go ahead and read. I'm going to read chapter 3. I'm going to try to, try to just get through this. Bear with me. It says, For this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the Gentiles. Okay, that's what his calling is. He's supposed to go out. He, his vision is, I get to go out and reach the Gentiles. I love what he says back in Romans. He says, I am all things to all men. So guess what? When he's a Gentile, he speaks to them in their language. He speaks to them in their understanding. When he's with the Jews, he's got that mindset. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says, I think it was with Galil, he was who he studied with. He could sit there with the greatest of the Pharisees and knock heads with them. But this, at this time, as he's reading, or as he's writing here in Ephesians, he says, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Verse 2. If indeed you heard of the dispensation of grace God which is, was given to me, how that by revelation he made known to me, here's that word, the mystery, as I have briefly written already, but which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. There it is, but he just keeps talking about this mystery. This thing that, even though I'm dead set right in the middle of this thing, it's more than I can wrap my mind around. It's like, yeah, I keep sharing Jesus and these people getting saved and it ain't me. It has nothing to do with me. I just keep feeding the food. They keep receiving it. Verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. It says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I become a minister according to the gift of the grace that was given to me by the evidence of his power. When his power shows up, it's like, man, this, this is big. This is a mystery. I can't put my mind in. Verse 8. To me, who am least or less than all the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what the, is in the fellowship of the mystery. 
which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Verse 20, 11. According to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. You know something? We ain't out there doing this in our own strength. We get to go in boldness. We get to go in strength. But he gives us a vision. He starts giving us an idea. How do you do this? What, how's this going to be the most productive for the Lord? Back again, I want to bring this back for just a second. Statistics say, because the group that we deal with, I mean, some of them are in their 20s, but for the most part, they're, 30, they're north of 30, 30 and north. How's that? And so here I am as I studied this and thought about it, and I thought, man, I'm fishing again in a pond that don't have a lot of fish in it, supposedly. So how can I be most productive? I've been fishing a few times with Tony, and Tony will about wear out his tackle box trying to figure out what they're going to hit on. He does. He goes through it. He looks. He goes, okay, they aren't hitting on this. They aren't hitting on this. And it's like... Man, if you're cutting only off that much line, by the time we get done today, you're not going to have any line left on your pole. <laughs> but isn't that what we should do as believers? What's going to work? What's going to give us the opportunity to what God has called us to? Verse 12, it says, In whom we have boldness and access, confidence through faith in Him, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, and to the strength he be strengthened with might through his glory spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and the depth, and the height. That's my goal. I want to know every, I want to know every dimension. The only way I get to know that is just keep stepping out in faith. And then I see this mystery, this thing that I can't put my mind around, and I go, okay, I want to see more of that, because guess what? I get to see God, even beyond my understanding. About a year ago, I remember Marcy coming to me one time, and she was at a meeting somewhere, and the lady said to her, um, she goes, Man, I wish we could still see miracles like we used to. And I thought, man, come to the tea home. Come out to Renaissance Ranch. And I don't mean that as a pun, but, but God's showing up out there all the time. We'll finish this out. <clears throat> Verse 19, it says, To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. There it is. It isn't a mystery. It passes my knowledge. That's what it's saying. I can't put my mind around it. It says that I need to try and understand it, but I can't. It passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Three weeks ago, I shared this same verse. Matter of fact, as I've, as I've shared this with you guys, my season of life verse today is Ephesians 3.20. And it's just for this season, because guess what? I, I'm not that one that has a, a life verse that lasts me all the time. It seems like, okay, this is where I'm at today. But it says, Now unto him who is able... To do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. And to him 
be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We've ended up with the opportunity. Uh, um, I'm going to get a little vulnerable right now, if that's okay. Um, this last week has been rough. As a matter of fact, as, I, as, I, as I'm driving home from work, um, I know everybody's going, work? I thought you were retired. Just to share with you, some of you know, some of you don't. Um, shortly after I retired, we got involved with Renaissance Ranch as the old Idaho Youth Ranch out there. Um, what they've ended up with is um, we have about 26 uh, inpatients in that program for 16 or a 60-day um, inpatient program. I have the opportunity to share the grace, the love of Jesus Christ out there, and and then we have about the same amount of guys in IOP, which is intense outpatient. Matter of fact, a number of you guys have donated clothes to help us out because a lot of those guys are showing up there uh, with no more clothes than what they have on their back. Sometimes that's a pair of sweats, or I, I'm going to be brutally honest, sometimes it's the same clothes that they were wearing when they were arrested. Um, thread worn, beat up. And yesterday as, as I was there, <clears throat> And this young kid, 31 years old, going through detox, he's standing there shaking and shaking, he can't even hold still. And uh, it just so happened that we had two, two uh, staff there, and so I was able to grab this kid, and I went and took him off site. He goes, man, I'm, I'm out of here. He goes, I can't do it. I ain't, I ain't got it in me. He goes, I'm about ready to go nuts. He goes, Dallas, I can't do this. And I sat there and I talked to him and I talked to him and talked to him. And I said, you know, God forgives you. He goes, man, don't even go there, bro. Go, what do you mean? He goes, you have, you have any idea all the names that I've called God and what I've said to him and all that things? I go, you want to hear something honest? Years ago in the middle of my addiction, I did the same thing. God's not standing up there going, oh man, I can't ever forgive him because he said something bad to me. I'd almost guess everyone in this room at one time or another said something to God that you got done with it and you went, whoa, that's a little bit brutal. Spent an hour and a half with him. I thought he had turned a corner. I went over with the rest of the guys, went over to the gym, and all of a sudden we have a, a app, get an, or get a notification on the app that, that uh, he decided he was going to leave again. So the, the, the owner of the facility got a hold of me and said, hey, would you mind just taking him around the, the facility and stuff like that, showing him around. And even now, I'm completely un remembering in my mind, we've got a little church out there. Um, I get a pastor of this cute little church <laughs> out, out at the Idaho Youth Ranch. It's like, man, this thing's countryfied. This looks like it, it fits me. And it, I mean, it, it's just it's just cute as a bug's ear. And, and uh, I grabbed this kid and I got him in tow with me and walked into that, that church. And we had some candles. We had some candles that were set in there that um, we had a visual for a guy that had been into the ranch. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, okay, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Here's an opportunity. And I looked over at this young man. I go, see those candles? He says, I sat with a guy about six months ago. And he says, no, Dallas, I got this, I got this. I'm going, I'm going to head out of here. And as that man made the decision...
to leave about a month and a half ago we got notified that he went back to using and as this guy had went back to using the cop showed up at his house and he grabbed a butcher knife and came at him and that guy's no longer with us as I looked at that opportunity, I thought, man, Lord, let this, let this be that thing. Let this be that thing that turns this guy's heart that he goes, no, you know, maybe I better stay here. He goes, Dallas, I can't do it. He goes, that ain't going to be me. I go, guess what, that guy didn't think it was going to be him either. message wasn't it? everybody walking away feeling good huh. something I've identified is where God has called us to minister to this 3% group is where a lot of them are real vulnerable a lot of them are really receptive to things of God even though I'm fishing in a pond that only has 3% success rate, quote unquote, by God's grace, He has set us in a place. Remember my story about the guys that studied the bucks? That they all kind of focus in the same area at one time and give them good success rates? God has allowed us to set ourselves up in a place where, guess what, we funnel through and we get that opportunity to raise the statistic, at least in our realm. When I finish up here, there's a... Back again, I want to I want to bounce a little bit on that, that scripture there. Um, <laughs> as God calls you to whatever He does, be at peace. Be at peace. He knows what He's doing. Pray for a vision. Pray for an understanding. I, I never would have dreamed. I, I never would have dreamed. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I mean, I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I can't really go into ministry because we're building our family right now. Obviously, the group that was up here just now, they're working on building a family also. What's the soul worth? A little discomfort? A little uneasy? <coughs> Losing a few hairs? A few of them turning gray? All we gotta do is just put the cookies where the kids can get to them. <coughs> Got three questions for you. First one, maybe you're just sitting here today and you're going, what has God given you to do? Is there something that's been tucked away in your heart? You're sitting there going, man, I, I ought to. I love something Pastor Mike does to me every time or everybody. I've watched him do it to a number of people. All of a sudden they come walking in and they, they ought to. They go, you know, Pastor Mike, you ought to. <laughs> Pastor Mike's got a job. If you're coming to him with a yada, yada, get in there and do it. If it ain't a yada, maybe it's a, well, you should, huh? Armchair quarterback, let me tell you how you ought to do it. Let me not get my hands dirty and go out and do it, but let me just tell you how you ought to do it. So as I take a look at that thing, that God has called me to do. My second question is, 
How do I get that accomplished? How do I get that vision accomplished? Maybe God set this path up, this funnel up to where you get to minister to that 3%, but guess what? By the grace of God, you get to get 75% of that 3%. Am I making sense of what I'm saying here? God might put you in that place no different than that archery elk hunter. Well, guess what? I only had 8 to 12 percent, but I get mine every year. You do know that vegetarian is an old Indian word for bad shot. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord. <laughs> yeah, I want to give you a, a third thing and I want to share with you. And I, I, I got some scriptures to back this up. I've already been 30 minutes. How do I keep the Lord in the center of this? Because when God starts giving you success, <clears throat> a little bit of a tendency for ego or pride or well look at what I've done you know how God keeps you humble humble get a march around with a 31 year old man then you try to throw everything at him you can and he still walks away, he still walks back to his addiction, he still walks back to that. I constantly have this reminder. I cannot fix anybody. All I can do is give them the tools. All I can do is pass those out and allow them, hopefully they'll take them. I can give them a phone call. When I get a phone call, I'll break down, pray with them. Hey, let's work through this. Let's let's take a look at what that is. I want to share my life first one more time, and then I'm going to tell another story just to finish it out. Really chew on this verse with me, if you would. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think take take and put that together he, he's even he can do more than I can even imagine I can't even imagine how big God can do this the Bible says back in Isaiah 55 8 he says for my ways are above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts says the Lord of hosts he, he can do this so much bigger you mean to just stand there going man Lord I just thought this was going to be a couple people who say I'll bet Billy Graham thought that all the time I'll bet I know Billy but Lord have mercy I just thought there was going to be a couple people get born again and, and that's where this was going to end up and look what's going on Because he was a man of God. He knew it wasn't about him. It was about serving God. But here's the amazing part. The last part of that verse. According to the power that works within us. It's through his power. It's through his strength. It's through his ability. He'll put a burden in your heart that you can't get rid of no way, shape, or form. All you can do is yield to it. Well, the only way you can is run away from God, and that ain't that good of a value. Ready for some statistics? That's what I'm going to finish this up with. So yesterday, I'm out at work, and I got about three or four dudes that done got born again. And they're going, hey, Mr. Dallas. That's why they always get referred to me. I don't know why they call me Mr. They think I'm old or something. I don't know what that is about. <laughs> you go, hey, Mr. Dallas. you have any more of those study Bibles that you brought out a while back? The ones who got the 12 steps right in them. They go, man, that is so handy. We're doing a Bible study every night down in a room. We've got three or four guys. Well, guess what? 
Do the math. 26 dudes, four of them doing a Bible study, then got born again. Substantially higher than 3%. Now let's go over or to ILP. In ILP, we got about the same amount. Matter of fact, I sent one of them the other day. He goes, man, this Dallas, I love this guy. He's, he's got a <laughs> he, he's got a southern accent. He, I mean, he, he just I just love it. Hey, Mr. Dallas. Uh, anyhow, I, the other day I was talking to him. He goes, Mr. Dallas. He goes, I've been thinking about going to CBI. And I went, really? And he goes, man, I kind of checked on that. He goes, but actually, he goes, I've been thinking. He goes, you know, I, I got eight months and I'm going to be sitting in this house in IOP as I continue my treatment here. He goes, have you got any idea if there's an online? It just so happens one of the ladies who graduated from our home is... And the Calvary Bible Institute is what it is. <clears throat> and so I sent him that information. He's looking at that. Why he is getting free from his addiction. He's looking at going to Bible college. Now, unto him <laughs> who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. What's your greatest vision? There might be some of you going, well, man, I'm, I'm, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too pregnant. I'm too not pregnant. Whatever excuse we might get. But if God gives you the vision, figure out how to get it done. Or maybe you just need to be the cheerleader on the sideline just helping those that are doing the heavy lifting at this time. Alright, if the worship group would come back up, I think that's how we do this. <laughs> Anyhow, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. <clears throat>